He was the wrong person for the job. Many years ago, our country elected its newest president, a man who won with 39.8% of the popular vote. Full disclosure, I'm not great at math, but even I can figure out that if over 60% of people don't think you're the right leader, that's not a good sign to start, right? It wasn't just his enemies that didn't like him. It was even in his home state. Listen to a newspaper article that was written right after he was elected. said this, His weak, wishy-washy efforts, imbecile in matter, disgusting in manner, have made us the laughingstock of the whole world. The European powers will despise us because we have no better material out of which to make a president. Yikes. From the beginning, Abraham Lincoln faced an army of naysayers. He didn't have a lot of the things that previous presidents had. He didn't have this political dynasty that he came from. He didn't have wealthy family. He didn't have any sort of real education. He was self-educated. What would he look to to hang his credentials on? How could he convince people, 60% of our country, who felt he wasn't the leader that they needed, he wasn't capable of the task, how would he convince them that he was a leader built for this moment? Now, bringing it to our context now, and I don't know if this question's been swirling in your mind since last Sunday. It has for me. Maybe you're wondering how this new pastor... This young new pastor, is he ready for this? Is he ready to lead us? Will he take us to the place that God wants our congregation to go? Will our leadership team here lead us to accomplish the vision that our Savior has put before us? Speaking transparently with you again, full disclosure, I, I've been thinking about it a lot this week, and I look within and I find a lot of fear. Fear that I won't live up to everything God has called me to be for you. I think of a guy in Pastor Samuelson who loved you dearly for over two decades, and now you've got a guy, fresh-faced rookie out of the seminary. You know how, how I have so much to learn from you guys. I really do. And I don't know you all obviously super well yet. I hope soon I'll get to know you more and more, especially in the years to come. But I have an educated hunch that some of you out there today are wondering, where is this going to take us? Maybe you have some doubts and concerns about how this transition is all going to work. I'm right there with you. It's that question that churches all across the world throughout time have asked. What? What does a true spiritual shepherd look like? How will we know if we have godly, authentic, Christ-focused leadership? How will our leaders lead us to accomplish the mission that God has given us? Those questions aren't new and unique to us. Those questions were being asked by the same people that this writer of the Hebrews was talking to. This was a community of believers who grew up in the Jewish faith community, a honor-shame culture where their religiosity and their ethnic pride was so interwoven. And so when a Jew turned Christian, that meant a whole lot of life changes. Often it meant being ostracized from their family, it meant being despised by the government, It meant the sinful nature within raging against them, trying to tell them this isn't worth it. Go back to the stability and the foundation you had. Get rid of all this persecution and hardship and pain. It's not worth it. This community was looking for a leader. A leader who could give them hope. A leader who could bring them a sense of community unlike any other in this life. They were looking for the same thing that we're looking for. What does a true spiritual shepherd look like? When all the things in our lives that used to give us stability are somehow gone, where can we find perspective? Where can we find endurance and perseverance? 
maybe just like in their search for a spiritual mentor, you've been searching for that too. Maybe even without even realizing it. The one thing that we have in our society that's all around us constantly is change, right? I would even go so far to say that the one constant in our culture is the fact that things will change by the second. It's inevitable. And so when life happens and change hits you just out of the blue, who do you have in your life that's going to lead you back to the waiting arms of your shepherd? Sadly, a lot of people who have been involved with Christian churches around the world haven't had the greatest encounters with Christian leaders. I don't know your story, and I don't know the story of the people you love necessarily, but I'm guessing you know a few people that have been burned in the past by a Christian leader who didn't live up to the calling that God had given him or her. You know the scandals you hear on TV, the abuse that has happened, the money laundering, but even more personally, maybe it was that encounter with a pastor, a Christian leader, that just rocked your very soul. A Christian parent who is different Sunday morning at church than they were the rest of the week at home. A Christian friend who promised, or at least you thought, they would lead you back to Jesus when you were going through tough stuff in your life and they weren't there for you and you really needed them to be. Where can we find leadership? Where can we find a Christian leader who knows exactly where to take us? You know, we sang it in Psalm 23, you know, we're walking through that dark valley. You know, as a flock, we're walking and we see Jesus in front of us, but it's so easy at times. When you look at the Christian leaders around us who will always be sinners this side of heaven, and when mistakes are made, feelings get hurt, relationships damaged, the devil loves to swoop in there at that exact moment and try to convince you that, look, that under-shepherd, they don't know what they're doing. And if that's any reflection of the person who put them there, Jesus, is he worth following either? And you can kind of see how this game plays out. You're walking along in the valley, and all of a sudden you start looking at the caves and the crevices, and maybe you think, you know, maybe I'll find stability there. Maybe I'll find strength and security there. Maybe that's where I need to go. But you and I know the caves of our inner self, the caves of the world around us, yeah, maybe for a moment it seems like you have the security you're looking for, but you know the longer that you stay in that cave, the deeper you go into the cave, you're only going to find more darkness, right? So how can we combat the devil? He's trying to convince us that remaining in the flock is not the right answer. Well, this is how we can send the devil back to his gloomy, dark exile where Satan belongs. Look at what the spiritual shepherd of the Hebrews said that we should do. He says, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Notice the only leadership quality he mentions. The speaking of God's Word. That is it. He's not saying you've got to become somebody you're not. He's not saying you have to become this dynamo of a Christian leader. No. He's saying look at the outcome of their faith. Look at how they lived their life. Even through all the sin and the tragedy, they had the perspective set on their Good Shepherd. Look to that example. Follow their faith. Because Jesus is the object. He is the focus of it all. That's what a Christian leader is. And you, of course, know who the greatest Christian leader of all time was, is, and always will be. That great shepherd of the sheep. What does it say there? Who equips you with everything good for doing His will. Consider the outcome of His life. His compassion that drove him to leave perfection, to enter our world of infection, and to give you hope and resurrection. It's the same Jesus who was there before the creation of the world, who put this all together, who had you in mind as he was crafting the universe. It's the Jesus that the writer of the Hebrews sums up so well. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In this world of change and leadership turnover and leaders missing the mark, 
Jesus stays the same. His compassion for you doesn't go away. In fact, His compassion for you is so empathetic because He chose to live every challenge you've ever faced. He chose to go through all the pain you've ever felt. He chooses to reach His arms out to you and say, I get it. I understand it. I feel your pain. I can literally feel your pain because I experienced every drop of it. He came to this world for you. He lived that life we couldn't and He died for you so you could be victorious now and live a life of joy now and forever in eternity. He is our Jesus. It's like, I know that my Redeemer lives at awesome he Easter Him. It's, he is my Jesus, still the same. He doesn't change. And He has so many ways of showing His authentic and deep love and compassion for you. It would have been enough if He gave us His life, dying on the cross, rising again, but then He goes one step further and He gives you baptism. Where you can look at that baptismal font every Sunday and think about it every day of your life and know the unchanging identity you have in God's family. When you come up for the Lord's Supper, you can look at Jesus' body and blood, that personal, incredible moment where He actually meets with you in the deepest of ways to encourage you and strengthen you for all the plans that He has in front of you. He doesn't even stop there. He has another personal channel which He can direct His compassion to you. And that's through the leaders that He's put here at Christ. And I'm not just talking about myself. I'm talking about the council. I'm talking about everybody here leading one another back to the cross. He gives you an under-shepherd like me to lead you, if anything else, back to knowing His compassion and love for you. And that's, that's why I love verse 18 in Hebrews so much, especially right now. He writes, pray for us. I need your prayers. I need your prayers to be the pastor that God wants me to be for you. And so when that question gets asked, you know, what does a true spiritual leader look like? Why should we follow such a leader? The writer of the Hebrews has the answer for us. The Bible says it. We listen, we take pride, we have confidence in them because they are keeping watch over your souls as people who will give an account. Jesus shows His face to you through the leaders here at our church and through the Christian leaders you have in your life. Now this church family here at Christ, it's so unique. We live at a time where the devil loves to put divisions between anybody and everybody. Go on the internet sometime and you'll find his tactics. Whether it's politics, whether it's socioeconomic status, whether it's ethnicity, he tries to drive these wedges. But here at Christ, we have a community that goes above and beyond all that because our unity is faced, it's based in faith. We have a shepherd who guides us all as one. We walk together and how that drives the devil crazy when he can't get in the way of that. We know the people around us who are wandering like sheep without a shepherd and we have a place for them to find that complete community that they've been looking for, that spiritual fullness that you can only have when you're a member of God's family. We saw that compassion in action in our Gospel reading today, didn't we? Jesus and His disciples, Jesus finally gets to the point where He says, we got to go away for a while. we got to recover. we got to have food. we got to... But instead, He looks around and He sees people wandering, looking for answers to the deepest of life questions and spiritual questions. And His compassion drove Him to go above and beyond even physical need because he knew how badly they needed to hear the good news of who he was. And that same compassion drives you, dear Christian. It's that compassion that I hope to draw from as I ask you right now specifically for prayers because I sure need them. I ask, if I can be so bold, I ask that you pray for me that in everything I say, everything I do, I lead you to the one place that life comes together. The cross and the empty tomb where no matter what we're going through, we find hope. We find strength. 
I pray that you keep my family and myself in your prayers, and especially that I can demonstrate for you authentically and truly what a godly husband and father looks like. And I pray that you keep all of our leaders here at Christ in your prayers, that we can continue to show Jesus selflessness by how we act, by how we lead, by how we inter- interact with you and give you a voice in making decisions for our church so we get to see how God presents the opportunities before us to serve Him and His kingdom. So what does a true spiritual shepherd look like? Well, it's really not a what question. It's a who question, right? It says who our true spiritual shepherd is. He's the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, who equips you with everything good for doing His will, And may you work in us what is pleasing to Him. As we begin this new chapter here at Christ, I ask that you have confidence in our leaders here. That you speak the concerns you have, that you give encouragement when needed. I ask that you keep looking to Jesus, the shepherd who always stays the same. As we walk through challenges together, as crises come up, as change happens, Let's be leaders toward one another, leading one another back to our Good Shepherd. That even though we walk through this darkest valley, there is a light, a light that makes it all worth it, a light that Florence Conroy now is experiencing in heaven, a light that gives us our path in this life, and a light that will never tire or fade in the next life to come. God be with us in this new adventure. Amen. And to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be all glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.